Hello there, friends and enemies. I know you're out there. My name is Rachel GNS Middle. Gilbert and Sullivan is my middle name, and my middle name is my last name. And I am here on behalf of Forbear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them. Today we are going to be discussing the base characters. According to my calculations, and that is a terrible dirty lie because these are actually William Remmers's calculations. There are 19 base slash base baritone kind of have vaguely bassy vibes type characters. This was mostly done by seeing who created the roles. Temple was a big one so all of his roles automatically come under base. Let me just tell you before I begin the list which of these characters we're going to be discussing just so you're not disappointed to see that one does not show up but they will be on a different list. In chronological order, we are going to be looking at Jupiter from Thespis. From Tra by Jury, we have the Usher, the very deaf old man, and Sir Marmaduke from The Sorcerer. From HMS Pinafore, we have Dick Deadeye. From The Pirates of Penzance, we have both the Sergeant and, apparently, the Pirate King. From Patience, we have the Colonel. From Iolanthe, we have Private Willis and Strephon, which seems to me not to be a very basic character, but apparently our hands are tied. We have to put him there because Temple played him. From Princess Ida, we have Arak, Guron, and Cynthius. From the Mikado, we have the Mikado, which is the only character from Mikado that I'm going to use the name of because he's the title of the show, so it seems redundant not to in this one instance. From Radagor, we have Sir Roderick and Old Adam. From the Yeoman of the Guard, we have Sergeant Merrill. From The Gondoliers, we have Don Alhambra. From Utopia Limited, we have Sir Captain Corcoran, KCB. And you could ignore the upwards inflection of my voice because there are apparently no base characters in the Grand Duke. So that is the list. There are 19 of them. If I've forgotten to say any of them, we will soon find out. <laughs> Here are the parameters I have used for finding out which the best base characters are. As usual, we have a mark out of 20 for music. We also have a mark out of 10 for dialogue slash lyrics. We have a mark out of 10 for narrative importance, i.e. how important they are to the story as a whole. We also have a mark out of 10 for comedic potential. I didn't have emotional stakes or complexity in this category because I felt like that would be very unfair. These characters are not created to have high emotional stakes in general. If I did put in a category for emotional complexity or emotional stakes or anything like that, Streffen would get 10 points and every other character would get two or three points. And Spoiler alert, Streffen has already done pretty well, so there's not really much point in giving Streffen a boost. <laughs> so, starting off at number 19, we have the very deaf old man from The Sorcerer. I'm not having the notary and him be the same person. He is just the guy that appears in the second act. I'm going to assume that this character is not particularly problematic for the purposes of this video. There are age gap relationships and that is absolutely fine. It actually seems remarkably unpredatory if you just look at the text as it is. I think some people have blocked it in a way that maybe looks a bit predatory, but the actual text itself does seem to be fine to me. Constance is very much in favour of what is going on. There doesn't seem to be a big power imbalance. I gave him a 7 out of 20 for music. I think that was extremely generous, really, because all he does is I am a very deaf old man and hear you very badly. He sings two very similar phrases and has some comedic stage time and it's a lovely little small featured role. It's not a chorus principle because his aims really do differ from the chorus, so we can't call him that. But there isn't really much more to him than just he is a featured part in one comic song. And as funny as that is, he doesn't really have a larger part in the opera. I gave him a three for narrative importance. I gave him a five for comedic potential. I do think that most of the comedy comes from Constance in that song, but he does contribute to that as well. And I gave him 
a five for dialogue and lyrics because even though his solo stuff isn't really up to much it is very funny and it is like it is a nice little slice of life in the middle of this opera that's not really about him or even really Constance for that you can get into my soprano characters video overall I gave him a score of 20 out of 50 so he doesn't do extremely well but you wouldn't expect him to really he only appears very briefly and I'd say that when he's on he makes quite an impact so I would not say he's a bad character just maybe not one you choose to be if you had the whole spectrum of base characters at your disposal. Number 18 we have Sir Captain Corcoran KCB from Utopia Limited and I've realised that whenever I say that I go Utopia Limited it's like a tick I don't know why I do that but I'm gonna keep doing it because it amuses me to say Utopia Limited. I gave him a 13 out of 20 for music. When you consider how little music he has, that's actually very generous, but it is very well deserved because what he does have is lovely. That little aria, which I actually have considered to be an aria because I do think it is long enough. It's enough of a feature that I have counted it in my bass arias. I'm Captain Cochran KCB. I'll teach you how to rule the sea and tear up the simple goal. I, th I think it's lovely. It's so charming. It's very funny and very bassy. In in a way that is comedic there is something inherently funny about really low voices <laughs> and this character does show that very well I think the other one is maybe the sergeant but these two parts are just really funny because they're so low <laughs> It's good. It's 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 a groove. I, I do really like his number and of course there's the call back to HMS Pinafore. William Remus can probably tell me the closest date to 1893 when HMS Pinafore was revised but I don't know that offhand but can you imagine people must have just completely lost it when he said that like whoa there's a bit from that opera in this opera ah! and, and I also remember that there was a review or maybe it was an adjudication at the festival. I can't remember what it was, but someone who obviously didn't know Utopia Limited saw it and then they they complained saying, oh, they've taken a bit from HMS Pinafore and just slotted it lazily into Utopia Limited. And they had to be told, no, no, that is actually the music. Someone can tell me more about that because I've forgotten that, but I know it did happen. That's really funny <laughs> and extremely embarrassing for whoever that was. He also gets to sing in Society as Quite Forsaken. I don't think he gets any lines. If he does, it's maybe only one, but that's also an absolute banger of a number. I think that when that's done well, it is really funny and it's got really relevant lyrics. If you listen to the lyrics now, they ring very true in today's political climate. <laughs> I gave him a five for his dialogue and lyrics, just like the very deaf old man they're good and funny as I've just said but he doesn't have too many of them I've only given him a number two for his importance of the story whereas the deaf old man actually fulfills a function in showing how other people have been affected by this love potion Captain Corcoran himself doesn't really do much apart from just being one of the flowers of progress but he and himself doesn't have a particularly important part to play. He think he says he's going to do some things and then that is never really referred to again. So I don't think we can say he's particularly important. I also gave him a five for his comedic potential. There is a joke in there when he calls back to Miss Pinafore and it is a funny joke, but that's the only joke. So however funny that is, it's very quick and then it's over. But I do love this character. He's very fun. I don't really know how you'd make him particularly individual, but I'm sure that as an actor slash director, you could make a lot of fun choices with this guy. Number 17, I have given to Old Adam or Old Adam from Rudigal. I gave him an 11 out of 20 for music. I don't think his music is particularly interesting. He has that one duet at the beginning of Act 2 which I don't rate particularly highly or I only rate highly in virtue of its introduction and not 
because of its lyrics slash music once the singers come in. So he doesn't score highly there. I actually find that music even slightly jarring when he does sing. He has a nice little bit of ensemble in the Act 1 finale, but he doesn't really have anything more than that. So musically, I don't think he deserves more than 11. I've given him a six for his lyrics and dialogue. I do think he has a lovely scene in Act 1 with Robin, which does exposition really well. I heard that the best way of doing exposition is attaching emotion to it. And so when he's saying to Robin that he wants to call him by his right name once more, that's just so clever because his affection for Robin and really wanting to fill that place in his life is what gets across the information that that is who Sir Rhythm Murgatroyd really is. So I do think that scene is really clever and Adam does fulfill an important part of the narrative. I also gave him a six for his importance to narrative as well. In this sense, I think the lyrics and dialogue and importance to narrative, I gave the same score because his lyrics and dialogue really are just story. You don't really learn too much about him as a character. And that's maybe why he didn't score quite as highly as some of the others. I gave him a seven for comedic potential. I don't think that the lines he actually has, so his material, is very funny on its own, but I do think that there is potential to do a lot of funny stuff with old Adam. He can be on for quite a bit of Act 2 if the director wishes. I know that he's not meant to be there for the ghost scene, but apart from that, I believe he could be on for most of it, really. And just being on stage and being featured as a character can give you a lot of potential to do funny things, especially since he has adopted this new personality, Gideon Crawl. As I say, I don't think the material fully explores that, but we could, as directors slash actors, make a thing of that if we wanted to. Numbers 16 and 15 are Guron and Cynthius from Princess Ida. I gave these two the same marks because I believe that as far as the material is concerned, they are the same. Of course, as actors and directors, you can make them very different and make lots of choices. But I don't think either of these characters really stands out as being better than the other. You could maybe argue if you're being really pedantic that when they say yes, 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 in turn, the one that has the third yes maybe has the most comic potential because comedy comes in threes and whoever has the middle one is probably the most disadvantaged. But I don't really want to get into that. I think they are pretty much the same. I gave these characters a 12 out of 20 for music. I think if anything that was being stingy. The only reason I didn't give them higher is because they don't have very much solo at all. In fact, I think it only really is those yeses that they sing absolutely on their own. But they do get to sing in a couple of trios with Arak and those are very good. I will get more into that when I'm talking about Arak a bit later. I gave them a 6 out of 10 for their dialogue slash lyrics. They are very funny. Again, they come as a three, so it's not as concentrated as maybe the other characters, but what they do have is very funny. We are Warriors 3, and we may remark, though nothing can dismay us, and this helmet, I suppose, are all really, really good numbers. And what they sing in the Act 1 finale of Princess Ida, for a month to dwell in a dungeon cell, so they do get quite a lot of material. The only reason I gave them a 12 is because they're not solos and they're not featured as single individuals. I gave them a 5 out of 10 for their importance to the story. I don't really think the brothers are hugely important. Yes, Kitty, I know. When you think about Princess Ida and Hilarion, I mean, they're the main plot, and Gama and Hildebrand to a certain extent. The brothers are a side plot, and Arak is the main one. There didn't need to be three of them, so I think that these two, in a way, could be argued as superfluous, but I think comedy-wise, it's really clever that there are three of them, and I'm really glad there are three of them, because it resulted in some of the best moments in the canon. I gave them a 7 out of 10 for comedic potential. Sometimes when you are part of a group and all having the same thought, 
that can actually be very powerful and it can just amplify those emotions. I think especially the bit they have in the act two finale when they really are all singing as a trio and it's not just Arak and them echoing. But that is very much their song and that is the reason they have come 16 and 15 and not lower, despite not having individual characters or any individual comic potential. The fact that there are three of them is actually what makes it funny. Number 14 I have given to Jupiter from Thespis. And although I'm loosely thinking of the Baker Henty version when I talk about this, I do appreciate that we can't possibly know what the music really was in the 1870s. But when it comes to Jupiter's music, I've given him a 12, which I think is fair considering that he doesn't actually have that much, considering he does seem to be quite a big part of the opera. He's meant to be the king of the gods, and yet has relatively little musical material. He has a bit in that group number they have just before the Nicemus and Sparkian scene. He has a bit of material in the Act 1 finale. Then he has quite a fun trio later with Apollo and Mars, and then some good music there, but there's actually not too much of it musically. Since we don't know, I don't feel I can give him more than a 12. But I do think that looking at this list, he is in the right place, so I'm happy to keep his scores as they are, unless anyone could give me a really good reason why I've been stupid. I gave him a 5 out of 10 for his dialogue slash lyrics. As we discussed in my Thespis dialogue video, I think Thespis and the mortals have most of the funny lines. I do like Jupiter's scene with Thespis that just follows the railway song, but apart from quite a funny introduction where we see this big imbalance of status, where both of them believe themselves to be the highest status individual, and Jupiter's literally the king of the gods, and Thespis is just the owner slash director of this theatre company. That is funny in itself, but I don't know if the material really does that plot point justice when you look at Jupiter's lines. In his Act 2 material, dialogue-wise, he's never really the feature of the scene. It's more either Thespis or Mercury that's being featured in that scene, and his dialogue doesn't really tell us very much about who he is. I think his best material is maybe in the initial scene with Diana and Apollo. You do get to know him a bit then when he talks about the human sacrifices, that's fun. So he does have some good material and for that I've given him a five. It's okay. I gave him a six for his importance to the story. While I think that his presence in the story is absolutely vital to it, I don't know if he really contributes much that is particularly entertaining and for that reason he only gets a six. The main driving point behind the plot is the fact that Jupiter has given up temporarily his godship to this theatre director. So he does drive the narrative, he is important, but do we really remember him? Is he that memorable of a character? I don't think so, really. I did though give him an 8 for comedic potential. While his material isn't laugh out loud funny, I think that, as I was saying, this idea that he once was really powerful and now is being completely outstatused by this theatre director, I do think is very funny in itself and I think that would give the actor and the director a lot of opportunities to make him very downtrodden, to make him very confused. I think a very old, confused Jupiter would just be really funny. That would be comedy gold for me. Number 13 I have given to Private Willis from Iolanthe. To start off, I gave him a 13 out of 20 for music. I do like his song, I also like what he does in the quartet, but that is all he does. And say for that, I've not given him a very high mark for music. I think that the reason people like When All Night Long A Chap Remains isn't really for its music, it's really a lyrical number. And for that I have given him a 7 out of 10 for lyrics. I think that his opening song to Act 2 is just perfectly placed. It gets us back in the groove. So we don't really know who Private Willis is at this point, but I don't think it's terribly important. He isn't that important to the story. I gave him a 5 for his importance to the narrative. But yeah, 7 for dialogue and lyrics. I do think that the part he does play, it's some excellent political commentary 
but him as a character I don't think is terribly well developed but I think in this case it doesn't matter his purpose in this story isn't really to further the narrative by virtue of who he is he is just a device in order to allow other people to realize things about themselves his reaction to the fairy queen could be very funny i've given him a seven out of ten for comic potential so if you think about it even though this character doesn't even appear in act one just him being this constant presence in act two is very funny especially because we don't really know who he is he is just an observer so he is almost like a member of the audience who is in the show and that's what's so cute and sweet about him but I cannot in all good conscience put him higher than this because he is just not as complex as other characters maybe people who have played him can tell me like what kind of enjoyment do you get from playing a character who is just an observer who is like a member of the audience like what does that feel like and it must be really fun in its own kind of way it's a very different style of acting I think and he is a really loved character I think Private Willis he's one of these characters that people just think is really sweet and funny I know he appears on a lot of memorabilia you know he's got this iconic red jacket and bearskin cap I like this guy and I think his commentary is good number 12 I are given to Sir Roderick Murgatroyd from Redagore and much like Private Willis he only appears in Act 2 in fact he appears a third of the way through Act 2 so not even from the start of it yet what he does have is very memorable he leads the entire ghost section which I talk about a lot more in my upcoming chorus video as one of the greatest sections I think of the canon I gave him a 15 out of 20 for music and considering that's basically one song and then a couple of little bits on either side of it because I don't count what he does with Dame Hannah as a duet it's lovely the little bit of duet that there is in it but I count that as her song really but considering he doesn't have that much material a 15 is a really good mark and it just goes to show how good Nightwind Howls is it's just such an iconic moment of Rudigore of the entire canon in my opinion his entrance is one of the best of any character he gets such a fanfare upon his entrance and some Hamlet references alas poor ghost I know he doesn't sing that I gave him a 7 out of 10 for his dialogue and lyrics his scene with Dame Hannah it's short but it's so good where they're having this really matter-of-fact conversation about the fact that he's dead and she just seems a bit put out by it <laughs> and of course the dialogue in the middle of the ghost scene is hilarious but also terrifying he very much is the best of both worlds when it comes to being both comedic and making a dramatic impact not many of these characters manage to do that but Roderick really does I gave him a 6 out of 10 for his importance to the story I would have given him higher if he'd appeared throughout more of it a little bit like with Jupiter even though his existence is vital to the story him as a person and his character you don't really learn too much about him until later and then when you do do you really get to learn much about him when he was alive he doesn't ever really tell you what he feels about when he was alive what I find interesting about the dynamic of the ghosts is that Roderick seems to be the leader of the ghosts yet he is the one most recently dead you'd almost assume that Sir Rupert Murgatroyd as the one who first died would be the leader of them because he would have been the instigating factor behind all of these ghosts dying over the years I gave him a 7 out of 10 for comedic potential he is very funny I love their argument about logical fallacies in the ghost scene it's just Gilbert at his very best I think it's so good the Rodrigo dialogue in general I think might be the best dialogue I don't know if that's true we'll have to wait and see number 11 I have given to the Usher from Trial by Jury if we were looking at 
just sheer amount of material out of context so Roderick may have beaten the usher but when you consider how short trial by jury is I'm trying to look at how weighty his part is relative to the opera itself. He is a constant presence in the opera and you know exactly who he is from the get-go or at least you know what his role is and what he is tasked to do. His little catchphrase or motif if you will silence in court silence in court it keeps coming back all the way through i don't think i realized how funny this character was until i started studying for this video especially his little aria at the beginning oh my god that song is so funny and so clever and musically surprisingly really good considering that trial by jury was only their second collaboration I actually gave him a 14 out of 20 for music and that was almost primarily for that song because the usher doesn't have too much solo after that song but that song and his continued presence in the opera I do think are a little bit understated in the general community I don't think people tend to talk about the usher as being a part they want to play but he is actually really quite funny. I gave him a 7 out of 10 for dialogues and lyrics for this reason. From bias free of every kind. After he's just been telling you to hate the defendant and love the plaintiff. It's just really funny. It's just Gilbert's topsy-turvy at its finest. It's so simple, the concept of trial by jury. And even though the judge is the one who is leading proceedings from when he comes on, I do think there is a sense in which the usher is in control of the courtroom here, especially before the judge comes on. And he's very prominent throughout. For that reason, I gave him a seven for his importance to the narrative, even though he is not meant to be the focus from his song onwards. He is because his motif is just so memorable. I gave him an eight out of 10 for comedic potential. Again, this surprised me too. I was shocked by how funny I found his material when I was listening to it. And that's what you want, really, as the principal part. You want to not have to do very much work, but yet be really loved and really prominent throughout the opera. It's a bit like Nakaya and Kaliba from Utopia Limited. They actually don't have that much material, but they're the ones that most people will be talking about when they leave the theatre. Like them and Scafio and Fantas, obviously, but I think people really love those twins. They love those parts, even though they don't do that much. And maybe the usher is quite similar to that. Number 10 goes to Sir Marmaduke from The Sorcerer. Now this character is almost the opposite in a way. He does seem to have quite a lot of material and be a prominent part all the way through The Sorcerer. He has a big duet with Lady sang Azure at the start. It's very long, that duet, but it's very good. I think it ranked quite highly in my duet video. He also has a really funny recit before that, which I will get into in my recit video, but Sir Marmaduke, my dear young friend Alexis, is one of my favourite GNS numbers there is. He gets quite a bit of material, I believe, in the Act 1 finale, and he gets that awesome quintet in the second half. He doesn't have much else in the second half, but he does have some very funny dialogue scenes, which I'm going to get into in a couple of videos' time. But I'd say that even though his presence is constant, I don't know if he is as memorable, maybe, as the usher is in Trial by Jury. Correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like you'd remember Wells and Alexis and Dr Daly more than you would Sir Marmaduke. His story, I don't think, has quite as much of an emotional impact as the others do. I gave him a 15 out of 20 for music. As I say, he has quite a lot of it scattered through the opera. That big duet and then just little bits here and there in the Act 1 finale and the quintet in Act 2 and the Act 2 finale. I gave him a 7 out of 10 for his dialogue and lyrics. He doesn't have much dialogue at all, but what he does have is very funny. So I gave him a 7, which I think reflects that. But then again, in most of the scenes where he's funny, he's more of the straight man to Alexis going off on one about welling over with limpid joy. And Marmaduke can be funny in his own right. He does have some funny lines. I find his description of how you are meant to refer to your loved ones really, really funny and silly. Madam, I trust you are in the enjoyment of good health. <laughs> Sir, you are vastly polite. I protest I am mighty well. <laughs> I'm just in the enjoyment of good health. 
and vastly polite. I have no idea if Gilbert intended that to be as funny as I find it. And I don't know if people do find that as funny as I do. But see, Aline approaches, let us retire, that she may compose herself for the interesting ceremony in which she is to play so important a part. <laughs> I trust you are in the enjoyment of good health. <laughs> uh, anyway, I gave him an 8 out of 10 for comedic potential. These lines are so deadpan and stupid and so ungenuine in a way. I I love him. I do love this part, but maybe he's not come higher just because I don't think he's the most memorable part of The Sorcerer. And there are actually at least four or five characters who you'd remember, I think, more than him after seeing it. Number nine is Sergeant Merrill from The Yeoman of the Guard. Surprisingly, I only gave him a 15 out of 20 for music. I would have thought that all characters in The Yeoman of the Guard would automatically get a very high music score, but Sergeant Merrill's music isn't actually terribly good relative to the rest of the opera. Alas, I waver to and fro, he's in that trio. No problems there, that's, that's a lovely bit. His Act 1 finale material is fine, but not terribly inspired. Strange Adventure is good. And then Rapture Rapture, which I don't want to talk about again. His musical material, I wouldn't say, deserves more than a 15, even though it's perfectly fine. I may be seeing it as worse than it is because I don't believe it matches up to the standard of Yeoman of the Guard as a whole. I gave him a 7 for his dialogue. I think that his lines, while relatively funny, and he has a lot of them, can be quite clunky. He has that really strange one. No, my lass, but there's one hope yet. Thy brother Leonard, who, as a reward for his valour in saving his standard and cutting his way through fifty foes who would have hanged him, has been appointed a yeoman of the guard, will arrive today. The thing is, Merrill is hugely narratively important. I gave him an eight for narrative importance, but this is an incredibly thankless part. It's a lot of legwork. You've got a ton of lines to learn. It's not even the funniest. I gave him a 7 out of 10 for comedic potential. I do think there are funny things you can do with Merrill. He has awkward plot points with Dame Carruthers. The only reason I've given him such a high mark is because he just has a lot of material. His music, what he does have, have is pretty good. And he can be quite funny. And he's important to the story. But really, this is not a part that I would choose to play just because it's a lot of work for quite little reward. A little bit like Sir Marmaduke. He's not the most memorable character from Yeoman of the Guard. I mean, there are at least five or six characters that you'd think about as being like funny and more memorable, having a more emotional slash dramatic impact than Sergeant Merrill. Yet he has to do so much work. <laughs> so Marmaduke, I think, is quite a fun part to come in and play. But Merrill... I he has a lovely relationship with Phoebe. I really love how sweet and gentle of a father he is, how he lets her be independent. He's a really lovely character, a very sweet character. You do, you definitely get to know who he is. He is relatively well fleshed out. You get to learn a bit about his history, about his old relationship with Fairfax. He's a very important part of the story, just not emotionally. And I think that makes him unmemorable. But maybe next time you go and see Yeoman of the Guard, you can give Sergeant Merrill and the person who plays him a bit more love, because that is a lot of work. Dozens of people every year find themselves in a situation of playing Sergeant Merrill in the Yeoman of the Guard. If you know any of these people, reach out today and make sure they're OK. Number eight goes to Dick Deadeye, who actually also got 37 out of 50. I just felt by gut instinct he deserved this spot over Sergeant Merrill. Dick Deadeye gets only a 12 out of 20 for music. I know that's one of the lowest scores, but he doesn't have too much, really. He's got some great material in the Act 1 finale, but musically it's not terribly interesting because I think it's mostly recit. Apart from he thinks his one is Josephine. That's really good because what that does is it comes right after that really joyful trio, quartet, I think it's a trio at that point, 
and then completely subverts it and then they sing again over the top of it that's a really amazing musical section i'm looking forward to talking about that bit in the act one finale video but that's a great bit he's he's got kind captain i don't think too much of musically and then after that he doesn't do an awful lot i did though give him a nine out of ten for dialogue slash lyrics dick deadeye is such a clever character and in the movie Topsy Turvy, I was really glad that they made a big point out of this. Whereas the panache of pirates, the wit of the pinafore, from such a face and form as mine, the noblest sentiments sound like the black utterances of a depraved imagination. It is human nature. I am resigned. It is both funny and really, really dark. You could go several ways with this character. He doesn't have too much material relative to some characters, but his constant presence and his position as a narrative device just to be that sticking point. He is the block from Rafe getting what he wants and not because he's a villain, it's because he has himself been embittered by the fact that he has been prejudiced against. I gave him an eight for his importance to the narrative. I could even have given him more, in fact. I think I dumped a lot of those points into his dialogue slash lyrics. I only gave him a seven as well for comedic potential. I think because there is darkness there, that does take a bit of the comedy out of it. Gilbert, though, can find tremendous comedy in darkness, and Dick Dede is no exception to this. He does have a lot of funny lines. When he says, oh, Captain, I have news, and he says, oh, you intend to leave the Navy? And he's like, no. <laughs> There's a lot of potential for comedy there, even if it's not made explicit in the material. It's mostly, though, I'd say witty rather than comedic. So all in all, I think that Dick Deadeye is a character who does have a lot of potential, both comedically and just dramatically and emotionally. But Gilbert does him a disservice by not finishing off his story. Everything he does could actually be in a twisted way to try and protect Rafe. And also remember that he is being consistently told by all the sailors that his dreams don't matter. Rafe's dreams are important, but his dreams are not. And that's not fair. And actually, even though the audience are rooting for Rafe and Josephine, you can definitely see why it is that Dick Deadeye does derail their romance. You can see why he felt driven to do that. Basically, be kind to people. And don't treat people differently because of what they look like. And they won't turn on you and snitch on your romance to the captain's daughter. I think that is the message that Gilbert was intending to convey. But the trouble is, Dick did I never gets that redemption. He never gets anyone saying to him, you know what, Dick did I? You did snitch on me to the captain, but... A, it all worked out fine anyway, and B, I can see why you did that. And in the future, we should just be nice to each other and not treat people the way we treated you. To have somebody be a villain just because they have physical characteristics and not resolve that, that is tough. <laughs> Dick Deadeye is difficult to handle as a director if you want to not be hurtful. Number seven, I have given to the Pirate King from The Pirates of Penzance. Now, this is a part which I think loads of people actually want to play. But when you look at the actual material, I don't think it's as strong as people think it is. Because he's a Pirate King, I think there's this idea that he's this big, dramatic, romantic part. But because of that, he often falls a bit flat especially in that opening section, and even his song, Better Far To Live And Die, I don't think is terribly strong musically. However, I do really like his stuff in the Act 1 finale. He's got some really funny lines with the Major General, like, that's a great bit. His Paradox Trio and Away Away are great. He's got some great stuff in the Act 2 finale, and he gets the lead cat-like tread. I gave him a 16 out of 20 for music, a lot of that was the amount of material rather than specifically how good like individual bits are. But I do think he deserves getting a 16. And even as well as all of his solo material, he's just got this great presence in the chorus. I gave him a 7 out of 10 for his dialogue and lyrics. They're certainly 
clever and quite beautiful in places. His dialogue with the Major General is really good. His dialogue with Ruth and Frederick in the second half is really good. And the lyrics are very standardly Gilbert good, which means I give him a seven. I gave him a nine for importance to the story. He does have a very strong presence in story pretty much all the way through. I did only give him a six for comedic potential. My hot take is that the Pirate King is not a comedic role, which makes him stand out a bit with the other bases because they're all quite funny, almost just in virtue of them being bases. But the Pirate King, the fact that he's a very low part is never really used for comic effect. He's quite a serious part. Like, he's not really that funny. He's got a few little clever bits and pieces in the opening section, but ultimately his material is very much like he is the straight one and other people around him are the comic characters. The reason I'm being quite down on him is because I think that people do have this very romantic idea of the Pirate King and they think that because of that he must just be this amazing part. And I did give him number seven out of 19, so I do think of this part highly, but I do think he is a bit overrated. I think there are six base parts that are better than him, including somebody else in the Pirates of Penzance. Number six, I have given to the Colonel from Patience. I gave the Colonel a 14 out of 20 for music. That is my standard Patience music mark. I do love his opening number. If you want a receipt of that popular mystery known to the world as a heavy dragoon, it's, it's, really trips off the tongue nicely and lyrically I don't think much of it, it's just a list of names, but the tune is very catchy. The Dragoon's going yes, yes, yes behind him. It's one of those ones that you really feel in your body. I had a really good time setting this when I directed it a few years ago, along with Soldiers of Our Queen. It's got that kind of militaristic pomp to it that just does something to your blood and just makes you kind of quite excited. I gave him an 8 out of 10 for dialogue and lyrics. I've just mentioned that I don't particularly care for his initial song lyrically, but then after that he has some really great stuff. He's got some very funny lines, especially in the scene before If Sophia I Choose to Marry, and that song is great. It's clear that Medieval Art is great. The Act 1 finale he has some good material in. When I first put this uniform on, yes, that's pretty good lyrically, maybe again, not, not the best, but it's more for his dialogue than his lyrics. The Colonel is a very funny character, and along with the Major and the Duke, they actually make this really funny kind of trio, and I just think they're really, really sweet together, and obviously care so much for the maidens that they're attached to, and I think that's lovely. They're very wholesome characters. I gave him a 7 out of 10 for importance to the story. The fact that they are still pursuing these maidens is important, but I do think that Grosvenor, Bunthorn, Patience, Lady Jane, they're the main characters of this opera, and so I don't think that people would go away from this show, particularly thinking about the Colonel. You might think, oh, that section where there was the trio, then the dialogue, then the quintet, that was very good, but I don't think you'd specifically think of the Colonel. I gave him a 9 out of 10 for comedic potential. I think this character can be super boring, but it could also be like the funniest thing you've ever seen, especially in Act 2. That little section in Act 2 done really well, and the dialogue when Bunthorn reads the poem in Act 1, that's great, that's so funny, and the Colonel does have a relatively big part to play in that dialogue. There's so much he gets to do which is funny. The fact that he is a military leader, but he's also just a bit sweet and in love, and that's their main characteristics, just the fact that they really love the maidens that they left however long ago and have come back to see, and they're not angry particularly with the maidens for going off them and liking Bunthorn, they just really want to win them back and that's just very healthy and I really like it. It might seem silly me rating him over the Pirate King but I don't know, my gut tells me he does go above the Pirate King. I think there's more you can do with him comedically, I think that's the main thing, it's the comedic potential that really pushes him above the Pirate King for me. 
number five I have given to Donna Lambra from The Gondoliers. This was a part that I did not rate at all highly before I directed The Gondoliers and I would say that in most productions of The Gondoliers I've seen I do not like what people do with Don Alhambra. I think people tend to go down that very easy route of making him this predatory older guy and while that is true to the text I just find that quite uncomfortable to watch and I think that it loses humour as a result. When I directed it in the summer I very carefully cast a person who I knew could be predatory in a very self-deprecating way which makes him a bit safer and having seen him perform that way I honestly like that guy stole the show he got like the biggest cheer on every night from the audience they absolutely loved him it really opened my eyes as to how funny that character can be his lines are so good what does it matter as you are both republicans and hold kings in detestation of course you'll abdicate at once good morning <laughs> I do think that a lot of this is down to the actor but it's just he's got a lot of potential and I think that's the main thing. Musically I didn't rate him all that highly. I only gave him a 14 for music and most of that has come from the ensembles that he's in because I don't think his songs are terribly good but I do like Try We Lifelong and he gets to be in that which automatically brings him way up. But again when I did it in the summer People absolutely loved I Stole the Prince. It's bizarre because I'd never thought of that song as being funny until this guy did it. And this isn't me as a director, this is just the guy, he's just a great guy. <laughs> I gave him an 8 out of 10 for dialogue and lyrics. As I've been saying, there's some really lovely parts of the dialogue that he has. He's so funny. He, he brings some much needed comic relief to the Ducal Party. I think he's even funnier than the Duke of Plata Toro, to be honest. He's really funny in the second half when he's talking about the Lord High Chamberlain playing leapfrog with the cook or something like that. That's really silly and funny. I gave him a nine for comedic potential because as I found out in the summer, there is just so much you can do with this role. You can really take him to extreme or you can be quite subtle and deadpan with him. I just prefer it when people don't really hammer home that predatory angle because I just find it uncomfortable as a female person. I gave him an 8 for importance to story even though his character isn't particularly relevant to the story. He actually does a really good service in the story and he delivers a ton of exposition and I think that's the reason why people don't particularly like I Stole the Prince because it's more of an expositional song than it is an emotional song about what a character's feeling so it just comes off a bit flat but the amount of exposition this character has and the amount of information he gives to both the audience and the characters and the amount he hammers home that information as well he's a great addition to the story he's the person that traverses the invisible line of the gondolieri and the ducal party he's he talks to the ducal party and then talks to the gondolieri so he's the one that kind of brings the story together in act one and then continues to bring it together in act two whereas sometimes this might come across as a bit of a thankless part a bit like sergeant merrill this character does have a lot more comic potential and that's why he's come a lot higher than sergeant merrill and he's come in fifth place which i think is very well deserved and not a place that i thought he'd end up in so well done donna lambra i didn't think you'd end up there but you did <laughs> Number four, I have given to the Sergeant of Police from the Pirates of Penzance. So yeah, I think the Sergeant of Police is a better part than the Pirate King. And here is why. His music I gave a 15 to. So I gave the Pirate King a 16, I gave him a 15. When the Foeman Bears of Steel, I think is one of the most loved GNS numbers there is. And the Sergeant leads that number and has some really catchy music that is actually very good. It's not just spacey fluff that's funny because it's low it actually is really good and it's militaristic it's rousing it's exciting it's dramatic it's emotional even though I haven't included an emotional category in this the sergeant actually does get to experience a lot of emotion and his fear is very funny I gave him an 8 out of 10 for dialogue and lyrics if anything that was stingy because his dialogue and lyrics are really good 
honestly, that little bit of dialogue that he has with Mabel is utterly inspired. The director does not have to do much work to make that funny. If you just perform that just exactly as it's written and don't put any expression into the lines, that would still be hilarious. We should have thought of that before we joined the force. <laughs> they come in force with stealthy stride. Our obvious course is now to hide Tarantara. It's a they immediately start singing Tarantara. Policeman's Lot is not a happy one. Another absolutely iconic number. His material in Act 2 finale as well, we charge you yield. It's so dramatic. It's got a lot of tension. Just take a moment to consider honestly and admit to yourself that the sergeant of police is just a better part than the Pirate King. And I didn't realise that until this morning. But he is. Sorry, not sorry. I gave him a 7 out of 10 for importance to story, just because he's not in Act 1. But the second he enters in Act 2, he becomes vital to the story. Because he is leading the policemen that are going to go against the pirates. Here is my thesis about the Pirates of Penzance. Every character in the Pirates of Penzance is the same. They all have the same goal. And that goal is to perform their duty. Maybe with the exception of Ruth. Ruth is a bit... <clears throat> Don't know about Ruth. Sergeant of Police. Major General, Pirate King, Frederick, Mabel are all slaves to duty. They are slaves to their consciences. They are driven by needing to do what they feel is right. But I actually think that this is best utilised with the character of the police sergeant because it's done in such a way that's very funny. Mabel's duty is to stay faithful to Frederick until 1940. Frederick's duty is to rejoin the pirates. The Pirate King's duty is to live out this authentic life rather than living a much more comfortable life on land. The Major General's duty is to tell the pirates the truth because he previously lied. The Sergeant's duty is to fight the pirates and because you can tell that he really doesn't want to, <laughs> there's just so much humour that you can derive from that. And the song of Policeman's Lot is not a happy one is just a perfect little comedic segue after that very serious emotional section with Mabel and Frederick. Even though the characters I don't think are up to much in the Pirates of Penzance, it's just a perfectly balanced story when it comes to emotion and comedy. It's just everything is placed so perfectly. The Sergeant of Police, I do actually think his character is the most intriguing out of all of them. And I know that sounds a bit out of whack because he isn't on for that long, but just think about Frederick and Mabel and who they are. Yes, they're lovely and we love them, but do we really know who they are? I feel like you know more about the Sergeant of Police than these other characters. There's more to do with him. There's more you can do with that as an actor. I gave him a 10 out of 10 for comedic potential. These policemen are so silly. The Broadway production of Pirates has maybe coloured that opinion slightly because I can see when that comedic potential is taken to its extreme. It's possible that actually all these characters have a comedic potential of 10 if we were to be really brave and actually go for it. Who is to say that we couldn't have a chorus of the Omen of the Garb that did like a kick line at the end of Tower Warders? Why is that disrespectful, yet having a policeman walk around doing high kicks and silly things is not disrespectful? Because I unconsciously do think that to do that with the Omen would be really wrong, but I don't actually know why. So maybe someone else can help me understand that in the comments. Number three, I have given to The Mikado from The Mikado. Again, this is another part that I didn't think too much of until this morning. But he ticks all the boxes in a way that a lot of the other characters don't. I gave him a nine out of 10 for his dialogue and lyrics. I don't think that his solo is terribly clever, but I really love his entrance song with the alto. I love his deadpan delivery of those lines after the trio. 
describe it. <laughs> That's like one of my favourite pre-song lines there is in GNS. All his lines are just so matter of fact. All this is very interesting, and I should like to have seen it. But we came about a totally different matter. <laughs> I forget the punishment for compassing the death of the heir apparent. <laughs> yes, something lingering with boiling oil in it, I fancy. Something of that sort. I think boiling oil occurs in it, but I'm not sure. I know it's something humorous, but lingering, with either boiling oil or melted lead. Come, come, don't fret, I'm not a bit angry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is just utter genius. Nothing else is like this. What's good about it is that it shows off his status. When Brian Blessed was playing the Emperor Augustus in I, Claudius, I know that he was talking to the director initially about how to portray that huge amount of status that the Emperor of Rome has. The director said to him, that you don't have to do anything, everyone else around you will make you the emperor. And I think it's a bit like it here, because he in himself does not exude any kind of status. He's not a threatening character. He's actually just a guy. <laughs> and then everyone else around him is just giving him oh, all this deference. And I just find that so unbelievably clever and interesting in a way that I don't think many other musicals are. You don't tend to get characters like this. I gave him a 14 for music. I don't think he's maybe quite as good as the Sergeant's music or the Pirate King's music. I'd put him on a level with Don Alhambra, which I think is about right. But I do love the music he does have in the second half. I gave him a nine for comedic potential. I don't think he's maybe quite as funny as the Sergeant of Police, but hey, I'm perfectly happy to be proved wrong in that regard. I actually gave the Mikado the same points as the Sergeant of Police, he also got a 40, but I do think that the Mikado, just in virtue of being the titular role, and just being so unique and so clever, and those lines that he has are just so funny. The way he ends the show as well, nothing could possibly be more satisfactory. <laughs> And then that's it. That's the end. That's the end of the show. But he's also this quite evil dictator. And that's what's so bizarre about it. He's so strange, but also so well crafted. And he should be very proud of himself for being such a good character. Number two, and another hugely surprising one to come so far up this list. But once I've explained why, you're going to agree with me. Hopefully. Number two, I have given to Arak from Princess Ida. I'm starting to realise actually that Princess Ida is doing pretty well in these videos so far. I don't know if that's a coincidence just because those are the ones I happen to discuss first. I honestly thought that Grand Duke was going to win every video, but it's not won a single one so far. But Princess Ida has done really consistently well so far. Arak, I've given him an 18 out of 20 for music. I'll talk about the one I like the least first, this helmet I suppose. Musically, I think it's wonderful. I don't think it's one of those numbers that gives you tingles because of how good it is, but it is just very clever musically. It's quite Handelian, and I really hope I just said something clever. I love all the ornamentations that happen in it. It's like a lobster shell. <laughs> it's, like, it's just so silly to hear these lyrics about him taking off his armour to such beautiful, stately music. It just doesn't seem to fit, and yet it amazingly it does. It's just a lovely spotlighted moment for Arak. I will also just mention again the incredible trio in the Act 2 finale, which I'm really waiting to talk about in my trios video. Arak manages to keep the tension really high, because he has to lead this trio here. He is the main brother. And he manages to keep the tension really high while being very funny. Um, Ida, I really think it would be a good idea for you to release Hilarion. Because if you don't, his father is probably going to hang us. We're not scared or anything, but 
that would that would be nice. I gave him an eight out of ten for comedic potential. I think that you are a little bit limited in movement because they are chained up for a lot of it, but facially they can do pretty much whatever they want. Their first song is just gorgeous actually. It is funny, but as well as being funny, it's just musically so clever. You get to hear different orchestrations coming in in each verse. I gave him a 9 out of 10 for his dialogue and lyrics. He doesn't have too much dialogue, it's just the lyrics. The lyrics are so good. arik has got this really lovely line in his song, like most sons are we, masculine in sex. Even Arak, this misogynistic bully, is recognising that not all sons are necessarily biologically male. That's nice, isn't it? I think that's really nice. Well done, Gilbert. And people will say that obviously Gilbert didn't intend it to be read in that way, but do you know that? Do you actually know that? The answer is no, because Gilbert is dead. I give him a 7 out of 10 for his importance to the story, like with his brothers. They are important and they do drive the narrative. Their presence does help Ida make decisions and they have quite a large part in Act 3 when they fight Hilarion, Cyril and Florian, but they don't really play a big emotional part of the narrative, so for that I did give them a 7. But yeah, 8 for comedic potential. Arak is a great part. I do think it's right that he came a lot higher than his brothers. I do feel a bit bad how widely they've been separated. But I also think that if you're playing Gurren and Cynthius, you can really feed off that energy that Arak has. So I think those parts would also be really fun to play. And I have also seen productions where people have split the part of Arak three ways. So they've given all three brothers a verse in the first song and a verse in this helmet, I suppose. So they're a bit more equal. And I actually think that's quite a nice idea because they are kind of one unit and perhaps I should have judged them as such. Let me know your thoughts. Number one, I have given two, you've guessed it, Strephon from Iolanthe. I feel, to be honest, it's a little bit unfair that he's in this list, but he is a temple part and he is definitely a bass baritone, so we did have to put him here. He got three marks more than Arak. He got 45, Arak only got 42, so he most definitely wins. And I didn't even have to add a category for complexity or emotional stakes. He just wins anyway. I gave him a 17 out of 20 for music. Iolanthe, I think the standard mark for that is about a 16. I think it's good music, but maybe not as good as some of their later ones. But Strephon just has so much material in it. And actually what he does have is really nice. He's got a lot of material in the Act 1 finale that creates a lot of tension. None Shall Part Us is pretty musically. If We're Weak Enough to Tarry is great. He's just a constant presence throughout the opera. He also has a lot of music in that section with Phyllis and the Lord Chancellor and the peers. His comedic potential I gave an 8 to. I think he is a very funny character in virtue of his dialogue, but maybe doesn't have quite the same potential for silliness as the sergeant of police. He is constricted by being quite a real character, so it just means there are limits to just how ridiculous he can be. For his dialogue and his lyrics, I gave him a 10 out of 10. Those scenes he has with Phyllis are so funny. And also his lyrics that he has in his songs are great. I really happen to like Strephon's cut song, Fold Your Flapping Wings. I think the reason it was cut wasn't because it was bad. It was just because it seemed to bring down the tone a little bit and it maybe wasn't very nicely placed dramatically. But I included it when I directed it because I do think that it gives a very important political message in this day and age. And I had a guy that did it really well, so I wanted it to be in there. I also gave him a 10 out of 10 for importance to the story because, duh, it's Strephon in Iolanthe. He is probably the main part of Iolanthe. He is the one whose decisions drive the story, even though a lot of the times those decisions are kind of made for him by people. But having said that, his presence is vital to almost every step of the story. What I will say about Strephon is that he is so well crafted by Gilbert that maybe he'd be slightly less fun to put your stamp on. I don't really think when I've seen Iolanthe over the years there's been too much variation on how Strephon has been played. People have had different levels of success by playing him in this same way, 
but you are rather limited to how you can play this part. Having said that, it must just be a joy to play a part that's got such good music, such good dialogue, such really funny dialogue. Honestly, in that second scene with Phyllis, every line is a joke. And I suppose you have to understand the humour to make those jokes land, but I also think that it's quite easy humour to get across. I don't think the actor has to do too much work to make those lines funny because they are already really funny. And for that reason, I think Streffen's a bit of a boring number one and he is quite unlike any of these other characters in that he's not this like silly, bassy, low stakes character that the others are. He actually does have very high stakes throughout the opera. If he'd just been a typical romantic lead. I think he actually would have been beaten by a few of them, but he does also happen to be very funny. Just funny in a different way. He's written extremely well. Thank you very much for watching this video. Next time we are going to be ranking the choruses in the Gilbert and Sullivan operas. Please feel free to like this video, to subscribe to this channel, give me some validation. That would be lovely and I would appreciate it. And I will see you next time.